Hello, my name is Thomas, and welcome to British Culture, Albion Never Dies. This week, I travelled from just north of Hong Kong to Fuzhou, in Fujian province, on a journey of about five hours by high-speed train. There, I met Kane, an expert on British culture and on the traditional tea culture of Fujian. This is the real global home of tea, so enjoy listening to half an hour of two Brits talking about tea. Okay, thank you very much, Kane, for joining me a second time. No worries. Thanks for having me again. Yeah. And today we're talking about tea. Yeah, we are. I thought last time we spoke,、uh, we spoke about some interesting things, but they were very abstract, right? So、mm. I thought that we could perhaps talk about something which your listeners would be more familiar with, something that's a bit more tangible, which is British tea culture. Yeah, it's something that if you ask most people around the world, what do you think British people do? They'll all say drink tea at four o'clock. <laughs> yeah, exactly.、Um, and th- that's maybe not exactly correct, but generally speaking,、um, there are three kinds of stereotypes, right? As far as I can tell, there's the stereotypes which have no truth at all, and nobody really understands where they come from.、Mm. And then there's the majority of stereotypes which aren't wholly true. But they have a good grain of truth in them,、mm. and then there's a, a small minority of stereotypes which are 100% true. And I think the stereotype about British drinking a lot of tea—that's one of the ones that's absolutely 100% true.、Um, so that's. <laughs> I that's, should just say we're drinking tea right now. Yeah, we are. We are drinking some tea right now as we speak.、Uh, in fact,、uh, it might surprise your listeners to know that. Per capita, the British drink a lot more tea than the Chinese.、Mm. Um, for every one cup of tea that the average Chinese person drinks, the average Brit drinks about four cups of tea. Wow! Yeah, I didn't realize the difference was that big myself. It is. Yeah, it's it's genuinely really really big. So, like I said, this is a stereotype which is a hundred percent true. Um, it doesn't mean every single British person is a tea lover, of course,、mm. but as a general rule, yes, the British love tea, drink plenty of tea. Um, so yeah, I'll say right now, a lot of people might. Be listening to this because they know my James Bond account. So James、mm. Bond is a famous British character, super British, does not drink tea, blames tea for the downfall of the British Empire, <coughs> with no context or explanation. Yeah, you mentioned that、uh, before actually, and I was. It is a confusing one, isn't it?、Yeah. Especially because there's a.、Um, I've heard the saying that the British Empire was built on cups、mm. of tea. I've never heard it said that tea led to the downfall of the British Empire. Yeah.、Um, I imagine it probably has more to do with、um, Fleming's, perhaps. Distaste、yes. for tea, and <laughs> love of coffee. But、yeah. I was trying to think of how it could possibly be true. The only thing I could thought that maybe would、uh, support that argument would be perhaps if he was talking about the、uh, obviously the Boston Tea Party, which、mm. later led to the American Revolution.、Mm. Um, But even then, you can't really blame tea for that. I mean, it wasn't as if the the Boston、uh, the people in Boston hated tea; they they hated the taxation, right? And、mm. then, of course, the principle of、um, no no taxation without representation. So the Boston Tea Party was,、uh, you know, a protest against taxation and not having enough representation. It wasn't because、yes. they all hated tea, right?、Um, um, my girlfriend's from the U.S., so I've often joked that the thing that really upset the British about the Boston Tea Party wasn't that they put the tea in the harbour, but they put the milk in first. That was it. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Just didn't know how to make it properly.、Um, so I don't know. Maybe that that perhaps could have been what he was alluding to.、Mm. But again, it doesn't seem to.、Um, I don't know. It, it's、yeah. probably it, it was probably more of a throwaway comment、yeah. because he didn't like tea, I imagine. <laughs> But yeah, that's the、uh, what we were talking about before about how.、Um, There's a difference between what we think of as culture and what it means to live a culture,、mm. and you can absolutely meet British people who can't stand tea, and it doesn't make them any less British. I mentioned on the last podcast actually that I prefer coffee,、mm. um, but nevertheless, I do drink tea though. I drink、yeah. tea every day.、Uh, it's just that I prefer coffee generally.、Mm. Um, but certainly, as I said, it is one of those stereotypes that's pretty true. I mean, I know, for example, my mum wakes up first thing she does is makes a cup of tea, and you know. Mm. It, it, throughout the day, she probably has ten, twelve cups of tea, and that's not at all、mm. uh, extraordinary in no, the UK, no, right? No, it's it's、uh, very, very common. So it's it's something that a lot of people do. Yeah, and we are drinking here today some jasmine tea, which comes from not just this province but this city. And in fact, if you're a tea drinker in the Western world, then you owe a debt of gratitude not just to China but to Fujian in particular,、mm. because it was actually this province that. Uh, Europeans first imported tea from.、And、in、mm. fact, the reason we call this drink tea in English, because obviously, as you know, living、yeah. in China, the word, the Mandarin word for tea is cha, right?、Uh, the reason we call it tea in English is、um, because of the language that's spoken in this province. So, it was Dutch explorers. Oh, explorers may be the wrong word, but、um, Dutch traders that first came to this province and encountered tea and began to import it and sell it to Europe. And when they asked the locals what the tea, what this drink was called, they They used their、um, their own language, which so to give some context to this. Sorry, 
Today, of course, in China, the only official language is Mandarin. It's also the most widely spoken form of Chinese uh, in mainland China. Mm. Um, however, historically, there were a lot of different Chinese languages spoken in China. Um, and there wasn't one... There was the language, of course, of the, the ruling elites, but there wasn't really one um, official language mm. as there is today. Uh, and wherever you went in China, um, you know people would speak a different language, right? So the, the language that's spoken in the southern part of this province is called Minanhua, which in English would translate, I guess, as southern Min. Um, yeah. It, yeah, the language of, of the south Min people, I suppose. Language south of the Min River, I guess, something <laughs> like that. Um, in Minanhua, the pronunciation uh, the, of this, this character that means T is De. Huh. Uh, and so when the Dutch people first came to this province and they asked people, oh, what's this drink? Obviously, the locals used their own language to describe it. And they mm. said it's day. And day, when anglicized, becomes the word tea, mm. which is what we, we now call it today. Um, there is actually a story floating around on the Internet that the reason we call this drink tea is because uh, the British first got the drink in crates exported by the Portuguese. And the crates were labelled in Portuguese. I don't speak Portuguese, so I'm sure I'm going to mess it up. Something like transporte de exotic aromatics, right? Okay. Um, and then this became an anagram, T-E-A, mm. right? As far as I can tell, there, this isn't a true story. It's a nice, fun legend. Um, I've looked into it quite a lot, and I can't find anything that would constitute real historical evidence to support that um, that story. It also kind of fails a common sense test because the Portuguese have a word for tea, which is mm. cha, because the Portuguese first encountered tea in Macau, where they speak Cantonese, right. and in Cantonese they say cha. So yeah, it just it doesn't really make sense, <laughs> uh, whereas there's plenty of historical evidence to support um, the idea that tea is just the anglicized version of the Minanhua word day. And it, it, that passes a common sense test, right? So, yeah, um, if you do like tea and you're in the Western world, then you, you owe a debt of gratitude to the province of Fujian because mm. it's from here that tea was first imported. And as English speakers, it's where we get our word tea from. Right. And that's interesting. Again, we're used to the idea of Mandarin is the Chinese mm. language. Um, so it's hard to think back. Sometimes there were so many more different dialects. And they call them dialects here, right? But they are separate languages. Well, I think that's, uh, I suppose that's up for debate, and although I teach English, I'm not, uh, uh, I'm not a, a professional linguist, right? Um, there's also, I think, some politics involved mm. in, in defining whether or not it's a language or a dialect, but as far as I'm aware from what I've read, generally speaking, um, something like Minanhua could be reasonably categorized as its own language. Mm. Um, but generally speaking, people here would refer to it as a dialect. But the thing is, if you only speak Mandarin and you meet somebody who only speaks Minanhua, you most likely won't be able to understand each other. Yeah. So to say it's a dialect, you know, we could think about, for example, in the UK, <clears throat> say RP, received pronunciation, that's a dialect, mm. right? Um, Geordie, the kind of English they speak in Newcastle, is a dialect. And an RP speaker and a Geordie speaker could understand each other. There yeah. would be certain words that they might, that they might not get, right? Um, but generally speaking, they could understand each other. So if you can't understand somebody who speaks uh, another dialect, then to me it seems like they're probably not speaking a dialect of your language. They're mm. probably speaking a, a, a separate language. But and yeah. I'm thinking of you like Italian and Spanish. They are... Close, and I'm told kind of intelligible, yeah. but they are different languages. Well, and I think this is maybe part of the issue, right, and why politics comes into play and stuff, because um, how do we really categorise language mm. versus dialect, right? I mean, you c could perhaps argue that if Spain and, in, in, and Italy was one country, we might speak of, you know, Span uh, Italian as a dialect of Spanish, but because they're two separate countries, we speak of them as two separate languages. You yeah. know, and perhaps the reason we refer to, say, Minanhua as a dialect uh, and not a language is because, obviously, Fujian is part of China, right? Um, but, yeah, the yeah. fact is that if you speak Mandarin Chinese, then you call tea cha, and mm. if you speak Minanhua, then you call it de. Um, <laughs> in British English, we can say a cup of cha and a cup yeah, of tea. So. Yeah, exactly. And, I mean, you, you know, you can trace this as well, um, what languages call tea. Mm basically depends on where they encountered it in China. Mm. So the Portuguese, for example, call it cha because they encountered it in Macau where they speak Cantonese. Um, and the Russians call it, uh, well, I don't know how to say it, but something like cha because they encountered it from the north of China where people speak um, dialects of Mandarin, things that can be legitimately described mm. as dialects of Mandarin, like 
Beijing Choir and stuff. Uh, but yeah, we call it tea because of this province here. Right. Thank you very much. <laughs> no worries. But yeah, and that's simply what we call it. Um, and this is jasmine tea, right? Yeah, we're drinking jasmine tea, um, which probably sounds like it's a flower tea, but it's actually not. It's 100% green tea. Oh. The way they make it is by infusing the jasmine flowers with the tea leaves and then getting rid of the jasmine flowers and what you're left with is just the tea leaves but they're infused with the essence, the oils perhaps, I'm not sure the science behind it, but it takes on the flavour and the smell of the jasmine flowers. So this, uh, we're in Fujo right now and this is a really, really local tea. Um, Fujo is definitely the world centre of jasmine tea production. Most of the jasmine tea that you'll drink anywhere on earth will likely come from Fujo. There are a couple of other places that it's made, but the vast majority of jasmine tea in the world is made in Fujo. Um, there's obviously you know, historical reasons to that, but there are also scientific reasons. A big part of it is just the climate. We have here a great climate both for growing and making jasmine tea. Mm. So the jasmine flowers themselves grow in a really hot, humid climate, and in order to make the infusion of the jasmine tea naturally, it needs to be incredibly hot and humid. And in the middle of summer in Fujo, it gets up regularly to the high 30s in degrees Celsius, so 37, 38, 39 even degrees Celsius. It it's pretty common in July and August, and on top of that, it's incredibly humid. So 95% humidity is very, very normal. And Just quickly for American um, listeners, that's almost 100 degrees Fahrenheit, right? Yeah. So about 40 is about 100. Right, yeah, and as I say, the humidity as well, right? Yeah. So it's extremely uncomfortable, but this is the kind of climate that's required not only to grow jasmine and flowers well, but also to do the infusion. Um, I spoke to a guy who runs a jasmine tea processing plant, and he said the best time to process jasmine tea is when it's so hot and humid that you can't sleep in your own bed. Mm. So when it gets to that stage, then you know now it's time to make the jasmine tea. And what they do is they basically lay out um, in big crates. They do a layer of green tea, then a layer of jasmine flowers, then a layer of green tea. So you've got a kind of... Um, almost like a lasagna <laughs> of, uh, of green tea and jasmine flowers. And then they stick it in the crate and they'll leave it for four or five hours but then what they do is they they open it up and they throw away all of the jasmine flowers and they get fresh jasmine flowers so it's a very labor intensive mm. process um, and then over a period of uh, sort of days of doing this um, they eventually just get rid of all of the jasmine flowers and you're left with this green tea which as I say it's 100% green tea there's no flowers in the product that you actually consume but it's completely infused with this jasmine flavor which is um, it's very fragrant it's very sweet uh, unfortunately the, the, the jasmine jasmine tea that I just made for you is a little bit bitter because I over brewed it but generally it's a, it's a sweet um, and fragrant tea yeah and you've been to these factories right you've been to the I say factories you've been to the place where they make the tea yeah I have um, a couple of times actually one time I it was to make a series of videos for a local film production company who wanted to know about um, what me as a British person thought about the local culture. So I visited both the farms where they grow the jasmine flowers and I, I visited the tea processing plants as well. And it's really, really interesting. I say it's very, very labor intensive. Um, you know, I think you'd be surprised at the amount of work that goes into producing a cup of jasmine tea. Mm. It really takes a long time. Um, and it's very uncomfortable because you're working in this horribly hot, humid, nasty environment. Yeah. Um, but, but yeah, they, they do it here and they make some great jasmine tea and they export it, you know, across China and across the world. It's amazing. It is, it's great. And it's not far from here, right? So we're in the city centre. Mm. How, how far would you travel to one of the tea production centres? <clears throat> so when we talk about Fuzhou, um, you're talking about an area which includes the, the urbanised city part, but then all of the areas around it. And you and I, of course, went up to the mountains quite mm. recently, and you know that um, around this urbanised area is just loads and loads of lush mountains and fields. Uh, so the jasmine... The jasmine farm, I guess you call it a farm, right? Mm. <laughs> the, the jasmine farm that I, that I visited uh, was very close to the, the urbanised part of the city. In fact, it was still... Um, it was still within the third ring road. No, no, it wasn't. That's a lie. But it was, it was only just outside the third ring road. So it was, um, there's part of the city that's surrounded by a river and you take a short boat and there's an island in the middle of the river and that's where they have uh, their jasmine farm. How long so, did it take to get there? From where we are now, if you were in a car and the traffic wasn't too bad, not including the, the little ferry mm. trip, you could do it in 45 minutes maybe? Yeah. Maybe less, close, yeah, right. and that's not the only one. I so said I've been to a couple more, and I went to one which was actually more uh, within the the urban area oh, as well. Right. So yeah, there's 
you know, there's still big parts of Fujo that are very much just farmland mm. and stuff like that. So, yeah. Wow, this is tea country. It is definitely. So the tea itself is not grown in Fujo. Mm. Um, most of the teas uh, come from the Wuishan mountain range, which is a, a mountain range, a huge mountain range um, in Fujian. Um, but also sometimes actually to make the tea, they will import the, the green tea leaves because uh, in Fujian, green tea is not that popular. Mm. So, um, for example, the tea processing plant that I visited, the the owner of the plant, he imported his tea leaves from Anhui province. All right. Uh, but the it's the local jasmine flowers that are used. Oh, yeah. so it's a nice little blend. <clears throat> yeah, so that's something that, um, again, going back to what we were talking about before, about how uh, our ideas of culture and what we think of may be different to uh, the lived culture of somebody in the country. So I think when the average person thinks of tea in China, at least as, say, a British person or an American person, your, your mind probably jumps to green tea, mm. right? And that's not untrue, but the thing is, China's a big country, and it's very diverse, and their cuisine and their tea cultures are also diverse. Mm. So, for example, in Anhui province, where I used to live, which is also a tea-growing province, they drink almost exclusively green tea. Mm. So, you know, it's not that you can't get other teas, of course you can, but if you go to somebody's house, if you go to a restaurant, a tea shop, green tea is what you'll be drinking 95% of the time. Whereas here in Fujian province, green teas are not that popular. The main teas they drink are oolong teas, uh, which are grown in, um, grown in Wuxian. They also drink Taiguanyin, which is from the south of Fujian. I'm not an expert on tea, so I'm not sure how I could describe it. It's a, it's a different variety. Um, it's a very different flavor from, from teas that you might be used to. Uh, but yeah, that, that's very popular here as well. Um, whereas green tea just, again, you can get it, of course. It's just not that popular. The locals mm. don't seem to enjoy it that much. So it, it could be quite surprising if you came to Fuji and thinking, oh, it's China and be surrounded by green tea. But actually, most of the tea you get won't be green tea. Mm. However, it doesn't mean that green tea isn't popular in China. It just means that it's not particularly popular in this province. You know? yeah. And with, the, with every one of these, there's a uh, social custom. So, for example, you made a cup of tea and threw it away. Yeah, that's, um, <laughs> that's, that's an interesting thing. If you watch how people make tea here most of the time, the first, uh, you first fill up the, the kettle or the small pot, it depends on how you make it, um, and then you throw the initial, um, the initial brew away. I've asked a few Chinese people about this, and there's... You'll get different reasons. Some people say it's um, it's sort of an old custom. Some people say it's to, uh, it affects the flavour. Other people will say, and I lean towards believing this, that it's just basically to clean the tea. Um, you know, I've been to these tea processing plants. They, uh, it's not that they're unhygienic, but you've got to understand that this is it's a human process. Mm. You know, um, bits of dust could get onto the tea leaves, so just to make you a bit more comfortable about drinking it, you just essentially wash the tea. You're washing the first bit of tea. It doesn't affect the flavor um, in any serious way. And then what you're left with is a totally clean bit of tea, which you can enjoy without thinking, oh, there might be some dust in my <laughs> mouth or something. Um, but yeah, it's just, I don't know. It, there are other reasons that people say. Um, but to me, I, I do it because I, I, I know how the tea is made. And um, I'm not worried that it's going to be unhealthy or unhygienic, but I just like to make sure that there's no sort of dust or any kind of oils from somebody's uh, finger on the tea or something like that. You know? yeah. um, it's interesting the different customs you get with drinking. Uh, because obviously I've, I lived in Turkey for a long time, mm. and there's different customs on the island that I lived, Turkey, Cyprus, to, to the mainland, um, including small things like how, often, how many times you boil the coffee Okay. Heat the coffee. Yeah, I was wondering actually if you could tell me a little bit about uh, coffee culture in Turkey and then where you grew up in Turkish Cyprus. Um, I mean, I know Turkish coffee is very famous, but I don't really know much about what it is or uh, any of the cultural significance behind it. So Turkish coffee is uh, a lot smaller than regular coffee, mm. so it kind of looks like an espresso to a lot of okay. people. Um, I met a young man who went to Turkey as a teenager, um, let's say about 19. And it, it looked to him like a shot glass. Right, okay. Very unfortunately, he downed it in one. Uh, and of course, Turkish coffee is very grainy. So right. So you drink the top half of what is already a small cup. Ah, okay. The bottom half is grit. Right. Um, it should settle. So it would make you feel sick. Yeah, that's <laughs> interesting. It. Um, it's very strong, I guess, then. Very, very, very strong. Yep, so you've still got much of the coffee grounds mm. kind of in it. So most of the coffees feel very weak to me now. Um, and the, those bottom coffee grains are used for fortune telling. 
Ah, okay, it's interesting. Yeah, and I found that to be mostly the same on the mainland as in yeah. the baby land, as we call it. <laughs> so the the tea itself then is there's nothing. Ad- sorry, not the tea, the coffee. Um, there's nothing added to it. It's just pure coffee, or because yeah. I've heard of the like spiced coffees. Um, again, I haven't been to you know the Middle East or Asia Minor or any that part of the world, but I've heard of like people adding um, cardamom pods and stuff like that. Yeah, so that's more common in the Arabian Peninsula. Okay. Um, so the Saudi kahwe is uh, it's made from unroasted coffee beans. Right. So it's green. Okay, so that's interesting. I've, I've never coffee. had that. It's very, very unusual. So I've mainly found it in the centre of Saudi Arabia. You can find it in Oman, but they generally cook and roast the beans there. Okay. But they do add cardamom to it. Right. Uh, whereas in Turkey, it will be very much the strong coffee flavour. You could add sugar... But, as a gentleman, do not. Right, it's, um, not, it's not a done thing. Yeah. It's a ladies' thing. Yeah, well, that, perhaps, um, that brings us back to, uh, to, to how tea is drank in mm. the UK, right? Um, because I think people are quite familiar with the fact that we add milk. Mm. Um, and usually, if you, if you were to be presented with a pitcher of British tea, there would always be a pot of sugar. My personal experience, though, is very few British people actually take sugar with mm. their tea. I don't know, what's your experience of that? I don't have it as a kid. And yeah, it's the same as a kid, because <laughs> the kids, of course, love sweet things, right? Yeah. I remember always wanting about five sugars in my tea, but my mom yeah. would limit me to two. That was all I was allowed. Um, but adults, though, I, I, don't, I don't actually know a single British adult that takes sugar in their tea, do you? I think of one person, and I just remember it because he asked me how many seconds... And I'd never heard this expression, but he was getting the sugar content ah, and pouring Ah, okay, it. okay. But it's such a standout thing that it makes me realise how rare it is. Yeah. I don't know other Brits who, who take, you know. Yeah, I, I, I say it doesn't mean that people don't do it, of course, or that it's not part of, say, a, a traditional, you know, uh, British tea. But, yeah, I honestly can't think of a single British adult that takes sugar in no. their tea. Um, and even kids, I am, well... I imagine parents these days, we're a lot more um, informed about the dangers of a high sugar diet, right? So I imagine a lot of parents these days don't even let their kids have sugar. Mm. You know, when I was a kid, sugar, we weren't so aware of how bad sugar could be for you. So, I mean, my mum still limited me. I wasn't allowed the five that I wanted. (laughs) But, but, you know, I could still get two, right? Um, Whereas I imagine today a lot of parents probably don't even let their kids have sugar. Well, I have a very clear memory of my mother making me a horrendously sweet tea. But what had happened is that I'd previously taken, I think, two, two sugars... But she gradually reduced it when she made it over about a period of two ah, weeks okay. until I hadn't noticed. So I'd been right. drinking uh, tea with no sugar, and then suddenly she gave me the two sugars again, and I, <coughs> it felt sickening. Yeah. So then, but then of course you then realised that you know you didn't want to take sugar anymore, Absolutely. which was, was the goal, I suppose. Um, but yeah, that's that's something that we could perhaps cover is how British people actually drink tea, uh, because it might not be so familiar with some of your listeners, perhaps from North America. Um, going back to the history of tea, the first teas that were actually imported to the UK were oolong teas, um, because they were from this province, of course, and also green teas as well, which I think would surprise some British people, because mm. when we imagine our, you know, our Victorian ancestors drinking tea, we probably imagine them drinking the same tea that we drink. Yeah. So it's a bit weird to think of them drinking green tea, or particularly oolong tea, with a dash of milk. Uh, I don't know if anybody's ever tried tried that. Um, I have, because I wanted to see what it tastes like. It's not bad. It's not horrible. But personally, I don't find it very enjoyable. I mean, green tea in particular, and many of the oolong teas, although it really depends because oolong tea itself has a a lot of sub-varieties, but many of the oolong teas and green tea uh, they're very light and they have a very subtle flavour. Mm. So the the addition of the milk, which itself is mild and creamy, it, it just ends up creating a really bland cup of tea. Mm. Whereas the, the teas that we now drink in, in the UK, which is what we call black tea, the Chinese call it red tea, by the way, um, those teas, of course, are more bitter, they're stronger, and as a result, the milk gives it a nice balance, right? Mm. The, the mildness and creaminess of the milk balances out the strength and the bitterness of the black tea to create what most people consider a nice drink. Um, so yeah, although it's hard to imagine now, but actually many of our Victorian ancestors would have been drinking green tea and oolong tea. Uh, whereas today in the UK, um, the, by far, I mean, I can't understate how, how dominant black tea is mm. in British uh, tea culture. It's so dominant that if you say tea in the UK, you're almost always referring to black tea, yeah. right? So if somebody offered you a cup of tea, they're offering you a cup of black tea. Mm. If you were in a cafe and you wanted a cup of anything other than black tea, you would need to state it. You'd have to say, I want some green tea, for example. Mm -hmm. Um, Because in British tea culture, black tea is so popular that we just say tea to mean black tea. Uh, And actually, I've got a funny story about this. A friend of mine who I went to university with, she was from uh, the United States, and she came to the UK to go to university. 
In her first week in the country, she went to a cafe, sat down, waitress came over, um, she ordered a sandwich or whatever, and then at the end of it, the, the waitress said, do you want anything to drink? And she said, oh, I'll have a cup of tea. And the waitress said, okay, and walked off. She assumed that the waitress was going to perhaps come back with a tea menu or something, but of course she didn't. She just came back with yeah. uh, a cup of, of black tea and a, a pot of milk on the side. And she was a little bit... Um, Maybe annoyed would be the wrong word, but confused because she didn't actually want black tea. She wanted, I don't know, chamomile tea or something like that. But the thing is, in the UK, if you say to somebody tea, you're saying black tea because that's, um, that's all we think about because it's yeah. so popular. So although you can get pretty much any kind of tea you can imagine in the UK these days, and most cafes will at least have two or three teas, you know, mm. um, the reality is that... Uh, Almost everyone in the UK just drinks black tea. Yeah. Um, and black tea with the addition of a splash of milk. Yes, perhaps some people have sugar, but from uh, mm. my experience and your experience, it doesn't seem to be as popular as many people would think. I, I think when I was a kid, there were two types of tea, which was Tetley's and Yorkshire. <laughs> yeah, exactly, yeah. Um, which for the listeners, they're just two brands of, of black tea, right? Um, and yeah, another thing, I know that uh, a lot of North Americans like to have a slice of lemon with their tea and no mm. milk. Um, that's again. That's not common in the UK. No, no I've really counted that kind of in Betty's. So that's kind of a afternoon tea shop. Yeah, and it's a hundred years old, and you can. And that's the place with the tea menu. Mm, it's got a yeah. hundred types of tea there, but it's a special place. Right? Exactly. It's not the kind of thing. Yeah, you you'd go there. You know, perhaps on a Saturday with your friend or something. It's not. It's not the kind of place you go to regularly, or yeah. the place that you'd usually drink tea. Um, the only time I've personally drank tea with a slice of lemon is when I've had a cold. There's a bit of. Um, yeah. Maybe an old wife says the wrong way to call it, but there's a bit of a home remedy for a cold in the UK, which is a bit like a hot toddy without the alcohol. So just tea, a bit of honey, and a bit of lemon. Mm. Um, and I, I, that's the only time I've really drank tea with lemon in it is when I've had a cold. Generally speaking, it's just black tea, splash of milk, and mm. that's it. Nothing really that interesting or fancy. Yeah. Well, I, I didn't drink milk at all myself. Oh, really? And, uh, yeah. So How come? I'm allergic. Oh, I didn't know. Okay. Oh, well, there we go. Yeah, you should stay away from <laughs> but it. But I found, um, like, as a kid, that was quite difficult in the UK, mm. especially with tea. Yeah. But certainly. it's become easier and easier and easier. Every time, you know, I'm an expert. Every time I visit the UK, it's a lot easier. Yeah. I mean, that's another thing to remember as well, uh, that the UK is one of the most globalized countries in the world. And, you know, our country, of course, has... Um, influenced world culture greatly but we're also a, a sponge of world culture yeah. you know um so today for example uh as we spoke about both you and i are, are big coffee drinkers well coffee culture is huge now in the uk mm. you know um there are coffee shops in every single every single town right and you can get all sorts of coffee um and yes yeah, certainly all kinds of tea that you could imagine are available and all the ways of drinking it but it, it doesn't change the fact that still tea definitely is the national drink i think absolutely <clears throat> in fact you're mentioning betty's and afternoon tea that's an interesting one that i'd like to cover that's one of those things where the idea uh isn't quite the same as the reality. So a lot of people, when they think about tea culture in the UK, think about afternoon tea, which is this um, small meal where you'd have a nice pot of tea along with a selection of perhaps biscuits, you know, s slices of cake, small sandwiches. Of course, afternoon tea exists. You can get afternoon tea. Betty's is a place to get afternoon tea. There are other uh, shops or pubs, many pubs these days offer afternoon tea as well. But the idea that British people regularly drink afternoon tea just isn't true. Um, and this should be quite obvious, I think, to anybody who just uh, <laughs> imagines it in their head. I mean, imagine you were at work and you tried to just down tools and go and have a small meal at four <laughs> o'clock. What do you think your boss would say, right? Um, in fact, I'm not sure I ever had a formal afternoon tea in the UK. Okay. Um, it just wasn't something I really did. Uh, it, it's not that common is the point mm. I'm trying to make. Uh, it's not like British people regularly these days, or even I think in history regularly actually enjoyed afternoon tea, at least the vast majority of the British population. Yeah. Um, the way that British people drink tea is basically the same as the way that Americans drink coffee. Mm. Any time of the day, with or without food. Uh, it's not usually made into some special event, you yeah. know? Again, it's not to say that you can't have afternoon tea or British people won't occasionally have afternoon tea, but it's not a common occurrence. It's not a general, it's not a usual feature of most people's lives. You know, it's something you do as a special occasion, really. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, at the times I've been to Betty's, I've been, for example, after final exams at university. Exactly, yeah. It's, it's that sort of thing, right? Uh, and often, and here's, a, I suppose, a, a funny thing which shows um, 
how not so common it is for British people is that most of the places you'll find shops at offering afternoon tea are actually in tourist destinations, yes. right? <laughs> uh, the touristy parts of London, York, of course, right? Because uh, it's the tourists who are more likely to want to experience afternoon tea than it is for the average British person um, because we just don't don't mm. do it that often. Uh, also, another thing actually is that I've noticed um, the there's a confusion between what afternoon tea and high tea means. Mm. The, the words are often used interchangeably. Um, and I can understand why, especially because high tea, if anything, sounds more posh than afternoon tea, mm. right? Like high culture, you know, high, of course, being above mm. what is below. But that's not actually correct. So afternoon tea refers to a small meal which would be eaten or taken, I suppose, around sort of four o'clock. Um, it originated with the, the upper classes um, back in the Victorian times. You know, they, they didn't have to work, right? They could afford to sit around at four o'clock and yes. drink tea and have sandwiches. High tea was actually an evening meal that was enjoyed by um, the working classes, particularly in the working class um, industrial areas of the UK, so mm. the north of England, uh, the Midlands. Um, and it, it was a full meal. It was essentially a meal with some tea on the side. You know, it could have meat, fish, uh, anything that you'd usually have in a full evening meal with a cup of tea on the side. Mm. Um, and this use of the word tea still exists in the UK, particularly yeah. in working class communities, particularly in the north. So working class people generally, particularly people in the north, will usually refer to their three meals as breakfast, dinner and tea. Mm -hmm. So the evening meal is called tea and the, the middle meal is called dinner. Mm -hmm. um, whereas sort of uh, middle class people in the UK, sorry, it's getting confusing with languages. In America, <laughs> middle class generally means middle income, right? Mm. In the UK, middle class um, has a more traditional political economic meaning, which yeah. is, uh, you know, you had the upper classes who were the aristocracy, the middle classes were the wealthy property owning classes, and the working class was everybody else. Although this definition doesn't really pan out as well these days, it's still generally how we use it in the UK. Middle class means a bit posh, basically. Yeah. <laughs> so, well, I've talking to a lot of Americans recently, trying to, to dig into how to explain this. That Americans have race, and we have class. Yeah, you could say that. I mean, perhaps it's not so. Um, uh, antagonistic mm -hmm. or doesn't cause as, as many problems. Um, well, not now, but no. But historically, yeah. you could have said you could have judged it perhaps in that way. But there is a big hangover in uh, in language to how mm -hmm. we use these terms. So as I say, the the definitions are not so clear. Of course, we have a property owning working classes these days. There's you know disputes about well how. Um, how do you define working class, etc. But generally, in common day-to-day -day use, middle class means a bit posh, yeah. working class means everybody else. Um, so middle class people will generally say breakfast, lunch, mm -hmm. and dinner, or breakfast, lunch, and supper yeah. uh, is perhaps even more, is, um, is more common. Well, there's also lower middle class, middle class, well, these, upper middle class. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, so uh, it, it gets confusing. But um, the main point is that uh, high tea doesn't mean afternoon tea. Mm. And I know these two phrases are often confused. The term high tea is rarely used today. It's, uh, its descendant, which is tea, to refer to the evening meal, is very, very common in the UK. Yeah. But uh, yeah, but afternoon tea is that afternoon meal, which traditionally the sort of upper classes would have enjoyed today. It's something that you might do for a special occasion or if you're a tourist mm. visiting the UK. Tea is just what um, the British working classes or people in the North generally refer to as their evening meal. Yeah. And of course, we've talked before about how, as expats, we can become quite culturally conservative. So mm. in Hong Kong, you've got the Peninsula Hotel. Oh yeah, of course, which is very, very famous. Very yeah, traditional yeah. afternoon tea, um, which is very enjoyable. I, I can yeah, yeah, that. yeah. And it's almost exactly like you'd have in Betty's, where you could be there in almost any decade. Exactly, yeah. It's the same as um, the Raffles Hotel in Singapore mm, yeah. uh, does a really famous afternoon tea, and it's the same sort of thing. that They kind of go out of their way to make it timeless, you know. Yeah. Um, but yeah, again, that's it's it's really interesting. It's it's more, the stereotype of afternoon tea is more common, I, I, am, I think, in places like Hong Kong, Singapore, um, perhaps some other former uh, parts of the British Empire than it is in modern yeah. United Kingdom. Let's just say from the Victorian time, it's a very aspirational thing, right? So you mentioned the upper classes mm. originally were the only people who could afford tea, so maybe the, the new middle class, right? So going back enough centuries, there's, yeah, no middle yeah. class. there's no such thing as a middle class exactly, in the Victorian yeah. era. And of course, with a new class, people are working out how to behave. What yeah, to definitely, do. yeah. We see it in some developing countries, 
perhaps China, where you have a brand new middle class trying to work out what are the social norms, how does how how should we behave? Yeah, exa- yeah, that's that's very true. I mean, it was um, you know, tea spread of course from the 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 aristocracy, and then it was the the new emerging middle class, so these wealthy um, factory owners. Um, again, the class system in the UK, which is you know, we could do a whole other podcast yeah. on it. It's very complicated, but and uh, probably will. <laughs> Yeah, probably well. Um, but one thing that might confuse uh, some people is that it's not necessarily linked to wealth. Mm. So particularly during the Victorian era, many of the middle classes were far more wealthy than the traditional aristocracy. Yeah. But they nevertheless they couldn't access that world. You know, they were excluded yeah. from this world. They desperately, many of them desperately wanted to be a part of it. So they adopted um, the customs and the mannerisms of that aristocracy to try and be accepted. Mm. And of course, one of those was tea drinking and afternoon tea and so on. But it very quickly got into the um, to the working classes and and became such an important part of um, you know working class cuisine that actually during the Second World War <coughs> Churchill suggested rationing tea because of course it was extremely difficult to try and import you know during the yes. height of the war to import tea from India all the way back to the UK um, but he was actually advised against it by his cabinet because he, he said that basically look the one thing that the working classes have right now in the UK is tea if we mm. take that away from them or if we ration it, it who knows what could happen right you so you would think merchant navy lives were being risked yeah to get tea. tea exactly yeah yeah but um it was through even the very height of the war when we were rationing you know very basic essential food goods nevertheless you'd get as much tea as you wanted yeah. <laughs> you know um because it was just considered this really really important thing that we couldn't really take away from the working classes you know that is an incredible thought yeah yeah it is and on that bombshell we shall draw to a close in this podcast, we talked about the origins of British tea and brought it all the way forward to the Second World War and the British class system. Look forward to part two. Could we actually top up the tea? Certainly, and perhaps, certainly. Yeah, because I am a bit thirsty. Thank you. I drink a lot.